spend a lot of time teaching leaders what to do, but we don't spend enough time teaching leaders what to stop doing. Oh, oh. So what to stop, what to do. We want, we want to stop doing the things that cause misunderstanding and disconnections, right? The control stuff. What we want to start doing or doing more of is the influence stuff. Now, I'm going to say it again. There's a whole, remember we created and I had a huge list of those terms that you can do. But the reality is there's probably one or two things that if I would stop doing them, I'd be in good shape. All right. <clears throat> I'll tell you a story. This is, this is one of the things that um, I had to really, really work on. And I, I promise you I'd tell you a, uh, a husband and wife story right here um, and one of the things that changed my life. This material in particular. Okay, so Wendy and I. Anybody can see my wife? She came in for like two seconds. I saw her. Okay, and so um, she was here with the baby. And y'all could have Okay, it doesn't matter. just like right. she's okay. okay, so Wendy and I first got married, started the process, and every time I would end up talking to her, she would say something, and I would think, you know what, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. I don't, I just, I, that, that whole thought process is wrong. That doesn't sound right at all. I'm going to need to correct her. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is important. And so it wouldn't matter what it wouldn't matter what it was, but my D mentality was you need to debate and argue and you and then there needs to be a clear winner and a loser and it wasn't gonna be me. The winner was gonna be me, the loser was going to be her. She needed to understand that her perspective was absolutely wrong. Okay, so and and again it could have been so simple stuff like, uh, well you should treat someone like this. Now that's ridiculous, I'll totally take advantage of you, right? Uh, I'd say something like that from my deep perspective. That's ridiculous. They'll totally take advantage of you. Well, you're not even thinking about how they're coming across. I don't need to think about that. Let me tell you right now, if you do that, you might as well just, you know, lay on the ground and step all over you. You just don't matter. Okay, so then we'd have these every single time, and it just turned into that. And it didn't matter what it was. She was always wrong. I was always right. <clears throat> Ultimately, we would go through what I call her three-step process. Okay, process number one. And by the way, ladies in here, you are not going to like me. Okay, you're going to be very irritated with me. Give me a break. That was 15 years ago. We're still married. You know that. She just came in. Okay, but at this time, I just could not get it right. Phase one. I would say something obnoxious to her. She would say, try to defend herself to a, to a certain degree. I would tell her why she was wrong, and then she'd move into phase one. Phase one looked like this. She just stopped talking. Just, I'm not. I'm just not. I'm not going to talk anymore. And from her S perspective, that was a way not to make it any way. Of course. Okay, so she just stopped talking. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you're a D and an I, the number one thing you want to do is keep what? Talking. And you want the other person to keep what? Listening. Because there is nothing more irritating. Not even listening. You just want them to say something so you can tell them why they're wrong. Okay? They have, you can't do that unless they start talking. Okay? And so when she would be really quiet, it would literally ruin a good argument. You cannot, how do you argue with someone that won't talk? So then it made me mad that she wouldn't talk. So then I would look at her, she would just stand there, and I would say, you're just going to stand there, you're not going to say anything, is that what you're doing? You're just, not, you're just going to stand there. She's not going to say anything. So I just said that, and you don't, you don't have any thoughts whatsoever on what I just said. You're just standing there, nothing's going through your mind at all. That's what, the, that's what you're doing right there. Nothing? You know, you're not thinking anything? Nothing. And she would, if, if I kept pushing her, she would go into phase two, which is she would try to get away from me. She would just start walking away. I said, oh, you just walk away? Is that what you're going to do? Just walking away? And I would just, I literally would chase her down. Like, where are you going? Where are you going? You know? So right now, as you're walking away, you're not thinking anything. You're just walking. You're, just, you're still not thinking about what I just said. You don't have any, any thoughts or ideas about that. You just, you just treat people. Now, I tell gentlemen all the time, gentlemen, if your wife ever makes it to your bedroom and locks the door, that is a nonverbal cue that she no longer wants to talk to you. Okay? But I was crazy enough. I would sit behind the door and go like this. Not thinking anything? What are you doing? You just walk back there? Nothing? Nothing? Seriously? You gotta be kidding me. Nothing? Why'd you lock the door? She's loading the gun. That, yeah. <laughs> so so that's that that is phase two. Now if she couldn't now watch this. If she couldn't get away from me, phase one was she went real quiet. Not gonna say anything, you just stand there. Phase two, where are you going? You just walk away, is that what you're gonna do? You're not thinking anything right now? Phase three, if I she couldn't get away from me, I would actually push her to a point where she would anybody? Cry. Yeah, she'd cry. I could literally make my wife cry every time I did this. I was good at it. And every time she cried, it made me really mad. And I tried about four or five different versions of, what are you crying for? Stop crying. You don't need to be crying about this. I don't even know why you're crying to begin with. We were just having a discussion, which she called arguments, which I thought were just good debates. 
It doesn't matter. Anyway, so I'm sitting there thinking to myself, there is no crying in baseball, and there is no crying in arguing. That's just not right. Okay? And now I'm mad at her because she's what? Crying. Crying because we were just having a good heated what? Conversation. Conversation, discussion. Okay, so now she's crying, and now I'm really mad because you can't control crying. And it's just not right. It's just not fair. It is an emotion that is very disturbing to someone that just wants to argue. Okay, is that what you're going to do? You're just going to cry? Is that what it is? Uh, this is sad. Okay, so one time in particular, I'm going back and forth with her, and she said something, and I said something back, and then literally she just stopped talking. I thought, oh, man, I'm going to have to say something really obnoxious to get her to re-engage, okay? So I said, now, at that time, she taught second grade. So I said, you know what? Third grader could answer that question. It's not good. And she cooked her head like, oh, I was like, oh, good. Got her. Yeah, that's going to be good. Because whenever I can get her to go like that, she's going to say something. And I'm like, yes, all right, so go ahead, give it to me. Oh. And she looked at me and she goes like this. Do you want to know why I don't always say things to you when you say things like that to me? I said, yeah, go ahead. Okay, now wait. I got I to gotta reverse six months earlier. Okay, six months earlier. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Believe it or not, I've already been trained in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been trained in it. <laughs> trained it, teaching people it. I'd already gotten trained my, my second year um, of school, and now I've gone to training for the second time. He's actually having me come back and share some of the stuff I've been doing in my classroom with you know, people that are going through training. Oh, okay. So I'm an expert in handling people, mostly my wife, who I make cry every time I talk to her. So we're in Atlanta, and the gentleman that was my mentor said, you know what we need to do? Yeah, it was a Monday night. We need to go to this men's group. And I said, oh, okay, whatever. If you think it's good, well, fine. So I don't know what this men's group is, but I do know that he thinks it's good, so okay, fine, and I, I'll, I'll go to it. Well, the men's group was basically 90 men that had either 80% of them were divorced, about to be divorced, didn't want to be divorced, or just wanted to be a better man, okay? And there's a big group of about 90 of them. They're all in a big circle. <clears throat> when we were walking in, though, there was a gentleman that came up and he introduced me to him. Now, I remember, I'm 28 years old, got married when I was 25. And I look at this guy, and I used to kind of sum people up in college, I put myself through school selling clothes. Okay, I worked for Reno Spindler, one of the nicest men's clothing store in all of Austin. As a matter of fact, it was the nicest men's clothing store. Fifteen hundred dollars suits, you know, hundred dollars shirts. It was very expensive. Only about one percent of the population in all of Austin could even shop there. Michael Bell, the senators, the people that were there. You had to have a ton of money. Well, the reality was I measured everybody as I got older according to what they wore. Right, so I started looking around and I could tell pretty much, you know. Triple, this guy walked up triple pleated gabardine slacks, right? Cole Haan alligator shoe, very nice. Cole Haan alligator belt that matched Rolex presidential watch. It's about 30 grand, okay? He had the nice little silver glasses, silver gray hair, squared off jaw, a little bit of olive complexion, right? The 100% cotton button down shirt with the white shirt underneath. Nice. Slick. I'd already managed, you know, just tick, 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 tick. those pants are about 150 bucks right there. I know what kind of pants those are. And by the time he was done, my friend introduced me and said, this is such and such. Uh, he just sold his last company for $50 million. I was like, $50 million, man. Yes. So I'm all excited because when you're 28, you think that's the only thing that matters. You think, wow, how can I be like that guy? Okay. So I'm sitting there. I told you all that for this reason because now I'm sitting there and it's my first time I've ever been to one of these things. And I'm just sitting around, and it's just a, 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 a massive, I don't like anybody fest, okay? All the people that are divorced, you just heard it. Man, my ex-wife this, and my ex-wife that, my ex-wife this, and my ex-wife still cost me money, and I don't even, you know, I don't even know I'm married to her anymore. And the just list went on and on. And I thought to myself, man, these people are messed up. <laughs> About halfway through, $50 million man pipes up, raises his hand. I'm like, oh, yeah, $50 million. All right, let's go. He's going to say something good. I mean, you don't get to 50 million without knowing some stuff, okay? So I'm leaning in, listening to him. I'd like to make a comment if I could. And the, the leader's name was Aubrey. And he said, sure, go ahead. He goes, I've been coming here for about two weeks. And uh, uh, I'd like to just say this. I've been married three times and I've been divorced three times. And all those women had serious problems. And I was like, well, they couldn't be you, sir. You're magnificent. I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> I love those shoes. Okay, and so anyway, so he he said that, and I'm thinking, wow, ooh, that's, that's not good. And then Aubrey, the guy who's the leader of it, turns to him and said, if it's okay, I'd like to ask you a question. And I'm like, oh, right. 
Let's see what happens here. And so he turns to me and said, can, can, you know, you haven't been coming for the last couple of weeks. Um, do you want to know what all three of those women had in common? And I'm thinking, he just said they had serious problems. <laughs> I don't know if you listened to them. I mean, look at them. Anyway, and so he said, you want to know what all three of those women had in common? You. You, sir. You're the common denominator in all your failed relationships. It's like, <laughs> you can't say that to him. <laughs> you see his shoes? Those are nice shoes. <laughs> you can't say that to that guy. Literally, in my mind, have you ever watched the old cartoons where the uh, hamster gets on a wheel and generates electricity? Yeah. That's what happened in that moment. It was like, all of a sudden, it dawned on me that maybe I had a problem. Maybe I could do something about it. Maybe I was the common denominator in the issues that I was having, having in my life. So my hamster jumped on the wheel and went, whoa, and I went, nah, that's not me. I'm good. I'm married. I'm fine. My wife loves me. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see any problem with what I was doing at all. As a matter of fact, these people had problems because they were divorced and they had issues. And that guy had been married three times, although you were fantastic. You know, obviously those women really did it were messed up. Don't listen to him. Okay? All right. Fast back, six months into, and I'm standing there, and my wife is quiet, and I told her third grader could answer that. And she looks at me and says, do you want to know why I don't always answer you when you say things like that? And I was like, sure, yeah, go ahead. And she was like this, because I actually think about what I'm going to say and if it's going to hurt your feelings or not. So I just stood there and I was thinking about it and I was about to say something. But then I thought better of it because I was really thinking to myself, does she really see me that way? That I don't ever think about her feelings? And then as I stood there, she looked at me and she goes, she's going to stand there? Is that what you're doing? You're just going to stand there? You're not going to say anything? Is that what you're doing? You're just going to stand there? And I'm like... <laughs> walk away, is that what you're doing? <laughs> Did you lock the bedroom door? <laughs> Couldn't get away from <laughs> The reality was in that moment, something dawned on me that what I was kind of subconsciously thinking about all the time is that it was maybe things that I could do, maybe, that I could do that might not push her to the edge of crying every time that I wanted to prove my point. And somewhere in there, I finally stopped. And when she said that, it, I almost said this to her. I never think about your feelings. Is that what you're saying to me? I was going to take a statement and overgeneralize it just to make her feel bad again. But it, I just stopped and I thought, I hope she really doesn't think that I don't care about what she feels. Because somewhere in my mind, I really thought we were debating. The reality was, that's not how she solves problems. How she solves problems is she processes information slowly, thinking about everybody in mind, people in particular. Okay? That's a totally different way to solve problems than what I was doing, which is I debate really loud and argue, and then when we're done, let's drive some lunch. That was fun. Didn't bother me at all. It literally destroyed her every time I did it. That's not the first time I've told that story, obviously. But the reality is, is that I've had, I can't tell you how many Women come up afterwards and say, could you tell that story to my husband? Or could you do this? And the reality is, I could tell every man out there for the rest of their lives that story about what I just did. And if they don't have some type of standard in the background of values of how they want to be treated and how they want to treat other people, it won't matter. It won't matter one bit. That goes back to a value. When I realized my wife saw me in that way, I could not allow who I believed I was supposed to be and the standard which I have, my faith that I have, allow me to be seen that way or treat people that way. I had to take a good look at myself and say, is that the type of man I want to be? Is that the type of person that I want other people to see me as? You can be a D, and this goes back to what you said, Kat. You can be a D, an I, an S, or a C. Totally out of control, and it's obnoxious. It's a wildfire. It pushes people away. Or you can have all of the traits. One of my greatest moments in my life is when people just think I'm a high I and I don't have any D at all. But my D always sneaks out. I can't help it. It's like, you ever heard somebody that um, tries to speak Spanish but they're really, you know, American? Como estas? Muy bueno. <laughs> Alright, and then someone that really can speak Spanish, que estas haciendo? And you're like, oh, I was just kidding, I don't really speak Spanish. Okay? And when you do speak Spanish, you speak it with an American what? Accent. I try to speak S, but I do it with the D accent. Okay? In other words, I said I was sorry. I said I was sorry. She's like, well, it doesn't sound like you're sorry. Well, I said it. 
That's saying you're sorry, but with a deep what? Accent. Okay? So you, it's not my natural language to speak S. As a matter of fact, it is my lowest trait. And my D, watch this, my S is on the bottom and my D is on the top. So that makes me a double D, okay? And my I is on the top and my C is close to the bottom. So I'm also a double I, okay? Remember, two greens, two reds? All right. How are we doing? Here's the story and here's the end point. We spend a lot of time teaching leaders what to do. And shockingly, there's probably one or two things that if I would just stop doing them, what would happen to my influence with my wife? Wow. The second I would have stopped doing that, my influence would have improved. Now, here's the key. That would do, do you a bit of good to say it. You can say it all day long. Okay, I'm working on that, honey. I'm really working on that. The second you actually stop doing it, that's when it changes. You can promise someone, you can say it out loud, you can check in from time to time. The second you literally stop doing it and then keep being, was it, uh, is it Lisa? Mm -hmm. And we keep being consistent at it, then people go, aha, they were serious about changing. 